Welcome back to Tiga K Baptist Church Online. I wish we were seeing each other in person, but again, it's going to be a while, it looks like, before we get to assemble together. So let's continue to FaceTime with each other, uh, Zoom, uh, meet with each other, and uh, just talk as often as we can. We need to stay connected during these times. Uh, I miss you guys, and um, I just miss our church family. So thank you for joining in online. I hope you'll share this with your friends. And uh, if you're not a member of Tika K Baptist Church, we welcome you especially as our guest and uh, ask that you check us out online here. And when this gets over with, and it will, uh, that you uh, come visit with us sometime. We'd love to have you. Hey, this is Palm Sunday weekend. And on Palm Sunday, we see the account in Scripture of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now, they totally missed the mark on why he was coming. And we're going to look at the Scripture and, and break that down a little bit in just a minute. But you say, well, are you not going to preach on COVID-19 today? Yes and no. No, uh, I'm not. But I actually believe because they so missed the mark of what God was trying to show them on, on the Sunday, on the week of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that I, I think we stand uh, to be in danger of doing the very same thing here in 2020. And so I want to break these verses down from Mark chapter 11, and starting with the first verse in just a minute, and we'll uh, go through and see how he's speaking to us today. And I hope God's word will speak to you. Would you join me first of all as we pray together and we'll get into the scripture now in just a second. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to understand uh, this scripture that we're about to read. That you'd help us to understand not just with our heads and our intelligence, but with our hearts, our very souls, Lord. I pray that your word would mold us more into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I pray that you'd minister healing to us during this time. Many needing physical healing. Many others needing emotional and spiritual healing. God help us. We need you. And so we cry out to you now for your special touch, for your presence, and for you to speak to us now through your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 11, the first 11 verses. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. He said, go into that village over there, and as soon as you enter it, you're going to see a young donkey tied there that no one's ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, well, the Lord needs it and we'll return it soon. So the two disciples left. They found the colt standing in the street tied outside the front door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? And they said what Jesus had told them to say and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the very center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Your translation may say, Hosanna, Hosanna, and, and we've heard that, Hosanna to the Lord. And they're saying, praise God in highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and he went into the temple. And after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. And then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. You know, when Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he did so in a way that was calculated to get attention. He used a very symbolic animal for his entrance. The donkey, or colt, if you will, 
was seen as an honorable animal. Kings rode on donkeys in peace, but on stallions, on great horses in times of power or war or rebellion or uh, overthrowing something. But Jesus comes on a, riding on a colt's back, a donkey's back, as one who comes in peace. And the symbolism here is certainly uh, the king of peace, the prince of peace. He wanted to be enthroned in the hearts of the people. However, that's not what the crowds wanted. The crowds wanted a king for a day. They wanted someone, a Messiah, who would overthrow the government of Rome, their oppressors. They wanted someone who would come in and take up for them and establish them as the power holders, as those who are in control. And it was that kind of limited vision, that kind of limited commitment that the crowds of Jerusalem wanted as they saw Jesus entering. They wanted king for a day. They wanted a number one winner, as we'd say today, like we're number one, we're number one. That's what they wanted at that time. But instead, Jesus did not come for that reason. He didn't come to be king for a day. He came to be Lord of their lives and Lord of our lives. He didn't come to be a military ruler. He came, according to his own words, to seek and to save that which is lost. He came as the perfect sacrifice, perfect sacrifice, unblemished sacrifice for our sins. Well, the crowd on that day totally missed the point. They missed the main event that God was setting the stage for in human history. They missed the main event of why Jesus came in the first place. And I want to suggest today that we can be a lot like the crowd in Jerusalem that day. Not only related to Palm Sunday and Easter, but even related to the coronavirus and self-quarantine and thousands of people sick, thousands of people dying, thousands of people out of work and businesses shutting down, unprecedented times that we're in, people. And and, and I think in our desperation to see this come under control and to see things going back to normal, that we could miss maybe what God is trying to say to us. Well, I want us to look today at how we should respond to him, how we can really do this to, the, to Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, not just the King for a day. The first thing I want us to look at is how we miss the main event when we see the show, but we miss the message. Did you get that? We miss the main event that God is setting the stage for when we see the show but we miss the main message. People are really prone to miss the main event of things in life. Some people who go to a circus never get past the sideshow. And I know circuses are almost a thing of the past, but I remember going to a circus growing up all my life, and I'd be so fascinated with the things going on around the side and the different people coming in and the different exhibits and things that I I, I just... I didn't even see sometimes what was going on in the center ring, especially with being as ADD as I am and having three or four things going on at once. I couldn't focus on just one thing. I was trying to get it all in. I noticed I do the same thing when I go to a Braves game. I catch myself looking at the huge jumbotron, the huge screen in in center field, or that loud, obnoxious guy that's sitting in front of me acting like an idiot, or I get caught up in the cracking the peanuts and stuff that I have to have roasted peanuts when I go to a Braves game. So I get caught up in the peanuts or the frozen lemonade being sold all around me. 
I, I, I soon realized after looking at the jumbotron and cracking the peanuts and having my frozen lemonade and all this that I've missed the fact that they've scored a run. I'm there. I'm watching the show all around, but I'm missing the main event. Well, we do that with Jesus way too often. We cry out, entertain me, cater to me, make me happy, fulfill me, serve me, appeal to my motives, dazzle me. And so we seek the spectacular. And so we gear our churches to be more and more cool, to be more and more relevant. I almost can't hear that word anymore because it's come, become such a buzzword for trying to be cool in church. But we, we try to gear our churches towards being cool or relevant or, or like a talk show or a pop concert or local theater rather than trying to lift up Jesus Christ. But listen, Jesus did not come into Jerusalem then, and Jesus doesn't sit at the right hand of the Father now to dazzle us. He doesn't sit there and reign over all things for our entertainment, nor is he there for our prosperity. Now, he entered Jerusalem 2,000 years ago for one purpose, and that purpose was to die. He entered Jerusalem to die. Think about that. How many people this weekend, Palm Sunday, the week before Easter, and Christ raising, rising up from the grave, how many will see the show but miss the message. There's so much emphasis that's placed on drawing large crowds at, at all costs, on cool music, on new clothes, on springtime, in a new season. <clears throat> well, isn't it kind of interesting that that's all been taken away from us now? We're not this Easter going to have large crowds of people assembling together in buildings that we call the church or even at lakeside or ocean sides or anything else this Easter season. I'm sure that you've already heard on the news from this past week of the pastor in the large church in Tampa, Florida, who defied the order to self-quarantine, to isolate, to have social distancing, and they had church with hundreds of people there. And I saw on the news yesterday the pastor being led away in handcuffs. He was arrested for that. So I don't think we're going to be having all those things this Easter season. And I'm not sure. Now hear me out. For some reasons, I'm not sure that's such a bad thing. Because you see, there are a lot of things that go on around Easter that are kind of like sideshows that we can enjoy but not enjoy them to the point of missing the main message, or it's not enjoyable to the point that we should miss the main message. And I think that's what we can do at normal Easter season. Well, the main message is this. It's very simple. That God loved us so much that He sent His Son Jesus that all who would believe in Him would never perish but have everlasting life. You've learned that verse, John 3, 16, from your childhood up. And ultimately, he paid for the sins, our sins, my sins, your sins, and all sin with his life. He paid with the perfect sacrifice, his blood, his body. But then he rose again the third day. And according to his word, he's preparing a place for those who trust in him. And he's coming again. That is the life-changing message. And we dare not miss that message all year, but especially at this time of the year. There's a second thing I want to point out about this passage today. And that is we miss the main event when our God is too small. You see, Jesus was offering himself as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, 
the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. But they wanted a political ruler who would simply serve their selfish purposes. They wanted someone who would pass their bills, support their causes, fill their pockets, take revenge on the bad guys, and put them in charge. But Jesus wanted them to think bigger than that. And they chose to think small. Oh my goodness, I think we do the same thing. Stick with me on that. We're going to come back to it in just a little bit. But their God was too little. They wanted to think about their culture, their specific people group, their religion, their race. Jesus wanted them to see that their salvation was there in him and that salvation was available for the world through him. I got a question. Is your God too small today? You may be thinking about needing God to give you a better job but he may want to provide you total provision and security in him. You may be thinking about needing him to give you some fantastic house or something like that when he wants to give you a home in heaven for all of eternity. You may be thinking you need him to help you be happy and he may want to introduce you to, to, to true joy that circumstances and people and things can't take away from you. Sometimes you see our God is way too small. There's a third thing I want us to look at in this passage, and that is we miss the main event when we make Jesus that king for a day and not the Lord of our life. In Romans 10 verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, if you believe something in your head, that's one thing. You're aware that maybe that's a fact or you think that's so. Doesn't always necessarily move you to action. Doesn't necessarily always fill you with passion. But when you believe something with your heart, you just can't be apathetic about it. I mean, if you truly believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through him, that's in John 14, 6, can that be a king for a day scenario? Can that be a momentary winner for your satisfaction and for your personal victory? No way. Listen, if we believe in him and follow him and trust him, then he is the Lord. I, I, I've grown up hearing people say, well, I've accepted Jesus as my savior, but not yet really made him Lord of my life. That is such faulty theology. You know, I, I grew up hearing that all the time. Well, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you want to make him Lord of your life? You come forward today and walk this aisle. I want to tell you something, people. If you do not come to Jesus for who he is, as he is, for what he is, I don't know that you've ever come to Jesus. You may have joined a church or you may have become religious, but I'm not sure you know the same Jesus that I know because Jesus is either our all, our everything, or he's nothing. Listen, he is the Lord of our recreation. He is the Lord of our career. He is the Lord of our family. He's the Lord of our finances. He's the Lord of our entertainment. And he's even the Lord of our free time and our thoughts. Jesus is Lord for one reason, because he's God. In Colossians 2 verse 9, it says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. But Jesus is also Lord because he's creator. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, it says, For through him, Jesus, 
God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. That's Jesus. Jesus is also Lord because he's our redeemer. In Colossians 1 verses 19 and 20, it says, For, in, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So he died for the sins of humanity. He literally saves us. So the question, is that who he is in your life? Is he Lord of your life today? I want to suggest again that we miss the main event when we don't truly follow him. Um, in Matthew 4.19, Jesus said two words, follow me. That means act as he acted, live as he lived, love as he loved, follow me. We belong to him, and all that we have belongs to him. And we must learn to live in recognizing that we aren't the ultimate owners of anything. We're simply stewards of all that we have and all that we are. Anything, any good gift, any perfect gift, all we have, according to Scripture, is from him. And until we truly realize this, we can't truly follow him. But we belong to him, and everything that we have belongs to him. Also, we see from this we must obey him. Our character, our conduct, our conversation must be regulated by the word of God. Did you notice I said regulated by the word of God? Not regulated by what society now deems appropriate or acceptable. Not uh, dictated by any outside sources that tell us what's now okay and not okay, but by the word of God. It's not enough just to give lip service to Jesus. There's enough of that going around already. Churches are full of people who give lip service to being a Christ follower, but in actuality aren't really. But we're not truly following him until we're really ready to fully obey him. John 14 Verses 23 and 24 says, Jesus replied, all who love me, listen how simple this is, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them and will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone, listen to this, who does not love me will not obey me. It cannot be more clear than that. So we belong to him. We must obey him. And we ought to glorify him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Don't you realize that your body, in other words, your whole being, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body, with your whole being. And then we're told in scriptures that we're to tell others about him. This is also all together in what it means to follow Jesus. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, many of you know these verses, says, therefore go he had just finished saying that all authority in heaven and earth had been given to him to say what he's about to say. And because of the authority of who he is, he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now that's a promise. He's with us always. Jesus died so that we might be free of the guilt, but not just free of the guilt, but free of the penalty of sin. And so that God ultimately might be honored. What are you looking to Jesus for in your life? I I want you to think about that. What are you looking to Jesus for in your life? Are, are, Are you just looking to Jesus right now to get your life back to normal? Are you just looking to Jesus right now to get your business up and going again? Or to get your job back or a new job? Students, are, are, are you, no, you're probably not looking to Jesus to get school started back. But seriously, I mean, are you looking to Jesus just to be able to get back in school? Or are you looking to Jesus simply to get rid of coronavirus? Are you crying out to Jesus about your uncertainty in the immediate future? Let me quickly say, all of this is perfectly good. It's perfectly okay. We need to be calling upon Jesus. We need to be crying out to him for all of these things that I've just mentioned. But considering, listen to what I'm about to say, considering why he came and why he died, that Jesus would be way too small. In the midst of this global pandemic, Jesus is our help. He is our strength. He is our refuge. But he wants more than anything for you to realize that he's more than this. He's everything. He's Lord. He's Savior. He's Creator. He's God. He's King of Kings. He's the only one who can forgive you of sin and prepare a place for you in eternity with God. Now, do you understand on this Palm Weekend how you can see the show but miss the main event? Many are going to do just that in these times. And that's tragic. Many are only going to cry out for rescue. And Jesus wants us to understand life as He gives it in contrast to the thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy, he wants us to understand life in abundance. He wants us to understand his joy and not just happiness based on things that happen. Yes, we should call out on Jesus. Call upon Him. Look to Him. Pray every day for each other for this pandemic and everything else, but I still suggest if that's all we're seeing Jesus as in this time in our lives, then we're missing what God might might be trying to say to us through this entire global pandemic. And that is repent, confess, ask Jesus to forgive you, And follow Jesus. Again, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. What a tragedy to go through this time of crisis, self-evaluation, looking at what's important and not important in life, and miss the main event of all creation. And that is Jesus. If you follow him today, I promise you this. Not everything will jump into place immediately, necessarily. But it will finally begin to make some sense. God bless you, folks. God is with us. He wants us so much to call upon him. Let's do that right now. 
Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we would remember who you are. Maybe, Lord, there are some for the very first time that need to recognize you for who you are. And Lord, if that's the case, I pray right now, Lord, that as they watch this online, that they would pray to you something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me for offending you with my sin. Forgive me for rejecting you practically with my life. Lord, I repent of that. I turn away from that direction of life and I begin to trust you and follow you now, Lord. I confess that not only am I a sinner, but I need you. I can only be forgiven through you. For you, Lord, are the only true God. You are the Son of God, the perfect sacrifice for my sin and all sin. Lord, I turn to you this day and I ask you, Lord, to come into my life as I surrender all to you. Dear God, I pray that someone somewhere has just prayed something like that to you. And for others of us, Lord, who have already trusted you as Lord and Savior, I pray today, Lord, that we would listen to you because you are certainly speaking during this time. Help us to hear you. Help us to heed you. Help us to follow you. And to see that you are the main event of all creation. Lord, we praise you, we adore you, we thank you for letting us know you, for teaching us through your word. And I pray your blessings now on every household represented watching this now. And I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again real soon.